How much did I lose? Hmm? How much did I lose? Do you know how much time we're hmm? Fifteen to twenty minutes. Fifteen. I think because we. The they, time is. I, well, I hope they. I hope they don't cut the whole session short. But I think I, if, if, for this discussion, fifteen. I might. I think, I think, I think we aim for fifteen. That's good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Half an hour maximum. We aim for fifteen. That's good. Maximum. Yeah. Basically, between twenty minutes and half an hour, this is normal. Sense of twenty minutes, paper, and probably four speakers. Well, I've got more than ten minutes. I'm sorry. I've, I've got fifteen. Okay, fifteen. Minutes. Yeah. No problem. And I think and others may be trying. Trying to be a little less than 20. If, and, and well, we'll see, and, and if it's not possible, it's okay because we, we can catch up as, uh, as lunch time. They have a longer lunch hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But we start to vote Okay, and I think if we get going right now, that would be good. Speak anyway, you have a half. I think. I will leave a little bit more, but anyway. Okay, I think, I think sooner the better is good here. Uh, are we waiting uh -oh. for. Uh, any any prompting? Uh, perhaps Mark Kramer's thumbing through his paper. Oh, no. <laughs> Let's go. Uh, there's an old uh, saying in uh, uh, in uh, Serbia from the Yugoslav uh, days: "Samo napred, only forward." Uh, well, <laughs> Mark, why don't you just get us started here? Okay, here I'll um, I'll get started. Is uh, if I if I could pick up on the comment that Vlad Zubak made at the at the um, uh, during the questions in the previous session, I, I do see a real difference between what was going on in, in Czechoslovakia and, and for that matter, um, even in um, even in China, if you look at the communist world, th those two themselves were entirely different, but quite different from what was going on in Western Europe. Let me uh, speak just a bit about the Prague Spring, and then I'm going to focus on Moscow. I noticed that on the uh, the design here for the Romanian Cultural Institute it has the cities where where there are Romanian cultural centers and Moscow isn't one of them, which um, is probably <laughs> appropriate. But um, the the, uh, the thing that I will speak about, I think initially, is just to look at the nature of the Prague Spring, and that is where I'm going to come to the significance of the Soviet response to it. Uh, the paper is a fairly long one that looks at the Soviet response, but I just want to highlight some aspects of this that contribute to the broader theme of the conference. The, the one key question here was violence, that uh, the, the violence that I find so repellent in a lot of what was going on in Western Europe, self-indulgent and uh, sanctimonious and, and generally... Um, uh, something that that I can can't uh, put myself into the place of those who were doing it. Again, I was only a small boy at that time, so I can't fully um, conceive of what it was like. But uh, but it, it, as a undergraduate student in the 1980s, um, I didn't take part in protests. There weren't any really, except that I once organized a petition against um, the removal of Mars bars from the candy machine in my student dormitory. But that, oh. that, was, uh, that had nothing to do with politics. It was just my liking of Mars bars. The, the, um, the removal of it, I think, had something to do with politics, so I don't recall what it was. Um, the, the Prague Spring itself, uh, though was an entirely it was entirely peaceful throughout. It was an effort that began uh, at, through reforms in, implemented by the Communist Party, by by uh, the new reformers who had come in, Alexander Dubček, but others who were more radical as well. Although Dubček was certainly the symbol of the Prague Spring, at least in many countries. And those reforms, uh, though, over in, in a relatively short time, again, the Prague Spring in eight months achieved a lot. In fact, in some respects, even more than what was done in the Soviet Union under Gorbachev in, in over six years. And the Prague Spring in eight months, um, also the fundamental difference then was that uh, the 
reformers in Czechoslovakia and the Czechoslovak public were operating under the constant external pressure that they were aware of. Whereas in, in, uh, in Gorbachev's Soviet Union, the only constraint on him was from within the Soviet Union. And so in that sense, what was achieved then is, uh, is I've gone back and looked at those events. I have no direct memory of them, but as I've gone back and looked at them in the archives of, of uh, several countries, the thing that strikes me is just how remarkably bold it was and how far-reaching and comprehensive the changes in Czechoslovakia were. They began from above, but quickly took on a life of their own uh, below as well, and there was a enormous public support for what was going on, both in uh, the Czech lands and in Slovakia, but um, with somewhat different reactions in the two, and I can come back to that in the questions if anyone's interested. But. Uh, on May Day, the usual May Day celebration was for ritualistic um, uh, adulation of the Communist Party. May Day in, in 1968 was entirely different, though. There were spontaneous, enormous crowds out there uh, expressing their approval of what was going on. And it was at that point when people like Dubček came out and they suddenly saw that the Communist Party for the first time in its existence had become popular, that, that they uh, suddenly realized that things really were changing. And it goes back to the point that Charlie Mayer, I think, um, that Charlie Mayer brought out well in his lecture, which is, that things, when things take on a, a life of their own, not only do people end up in different roles from what they eventually envisage, but sometimes they themselves will actually like it that they have ended up in those roles. Sometimes they don't. Gorbachev didn't want the destruction of the Soviet Union. He ultimately had to go along with it. But, um, but certainly in Czechoslovakia, you can see that in the in the outlook of some of those who had, be, had uh, initiated what they saw as a program of reform from above to make the communist system work better, but as it moved along in a remarkably short time, uh, that they were quite willing to become bolder. And in fact, even in the face of of enormous external pressure, they continued to resist the major Soviet <laughs> demands during the crisis. There were three in particular that I would point to among the, the demands put forth by Soviet leaders during the crisis to first to reinstate censorship. The, in Czechoslovakia, unlike in the Soviet Union under Gorbachev, where censorship was never fully abolished, it was largely removed uh, through glasnost, but never fully abolished. In Czechoslovakia, it essentially was, not formally, but in de facto it was early on in uh, February and March of 68. So that was one of the Soviet demands to reinstate censorship. The second would have been to remove some of the more radical officials who were in fairly senior posts, or in some cases in the Czechoslovak Presidium, as the Czechoslovak Politburo was called. Uh, Yishi Pelikan, who was in charge of broadcasting uh, a key instrument during the Prague Spring. The, the radio and television broadcasts were of enormous importance because, again, censorship had essentially been removed. Uh, Václav Pechlik, who was in the who was in charge of the military uh, political section, uh, political indoctrination for the armed forces, and suddenly he wanted to move in a direction that essentially gave Czechoslovakia an independent military policy, or at least to move away from Soviet domination. Uh, and František Kriegel, who was on the Czechoslovak Presidium and, and certainly the most radical member of it. Uh, so that was a second Soviet demand to remove those officials. And that's something that was done in the case of Pechlik with the military only after he had, had given a news conference at which he was excessively outspoken. But it was not done with the others until after the Soviet invasion. And then the third major Soviet demand was for the disbandment of some of the unofficial clubs that quickly sprouted up in Czechoslovakia. Again, 
one of the this you saw this in the Soviet Union as well in the Gorbachev period, but it took considerably longer. There are the so-called nefamali, the the informal groups that took shape in the Soviet Union. That began very quickly in the Prague Spring, the formation of what described themselves as clubs, the uh, uh, club of non non -party, uh, party members, committed non party members who d were not members of the Communist Party, as the name implies, but wanted to take part in the political system, implying that they would become a party of their own. And similarly with K231, which was the article in the criminal code under which people had been subject to political persecution, uh, that club as well, former prisoners, political prisoners. And there were uh, even nascent groups, the, the reformed Social Democrat uh, Party and so forth. So they were, they were essentially what were becoming de facto political parties. They couldn't quite call themselves that, but that's where events were heading. So this was the third Soviet demand to outlaw these groups and to disband them. What's striking is, is again, that uh, except for the ouster of Pichlik, that none of these demands were met despite the enormous sustained pressure that Soviet, East German, Polish leaders were exerting on Czechoslovakia. So let me look just a bit at, uh, at the Soviet response and, and to point to how this fits into the broader theme that we're uh, coming to here. In general, my view is, is, very, is essentially the same as what Charles Gotti expressed in his uh, comments yesterday, that as is, is I see it, given Soviet objectives at the time, there really was not an opportunity for radical change in Czechoslovakia. That um, it is hard for me in retrospect, and much as I don't like to assume that events were inevitable, I certainly don't, for example, assume that the breakup of the Soviet Union was inevitable. That's one of the reasons that I become very uncomfortable when people try to draw too neat a line between 1968 and 1989. It, it looks much more coherent, I think, in retrospect than it actually was. But given Soviet objectives at the time, I do think that short of a drastic curtailment of the Prague Spring, essentially meeting those three basic Soviet demands that I mentioned, that there was an opportunity to have avoided military intervention. Soviet objectives essentially pointed in that direction. It's not to say that, uh, that the um, curtailment of the Prague Spring wouldn't have been an option. That, in fact, was the preferred Soviet way of dealing with the crisis, of getting the Czechoslovak officials themselves to crack down. There was repeated pressure exerted on Ducek and others, um, and in fact, until late in the confrontation, even into August, you can see in the contacts that Brezhnev had with Dubček, uh, especially over the phone, that there was still a last desperate hope that Dubček, uh, on Brezhnev's part, that Dubček would do it. However, Brezhnev was not, if, if one, once convinced that Dubček was not going to crack down, du, uh, Brezhnev was not going to eschew military intervention altogether. And so in that sense, the planning that had and preparations that had been going on since fairly early in the spring of 1968 for military intervention gave that option all along, even if they also could serve as a means of course of diplomacy and of bringing pressure on the Czechoslovak reformers. So fundamental change in Central and Eastern Europe, though, required a fundamental, as, as Charles mentioned yesterday, required a fundamental change in Soviet policy. And that didn't take place until the end of the 1980s. Uh, it, it, there wasn't the opportunity for Czechoslovakia, even if peacefully to move off on its own. So what the 1968 crisis, I think, added to what was already the lesson of the 1956 crisis is that peaceful change, too, could result in military intervention. 
The, the lack of any violent turmoil during the Prague Spring didn't prevent Soviet leaders from repeatedly drawing analogies to uh, Hungary 1956. Um, that was an event that they had experienced. Uh, all of the members of the Soviet Politburo had been in senior positions in 1956. Uh, Yuri Andropa, for example, who was he head of the KGB, had been Soviet ambassador in Hungary in 1956. So they tended to look at events in Czechoslovakia through that lens, even if there was no violent turmoil there. And there are, are analogies that I mentioned in the paper that were cited all along during Soviet Politburo discussions in context with Soviet leaders drawing analogies to the events of 1956. Dubček, uh, again, drew, had himself drawn two lessons from what happened in 1956. One was that as long as events remained entirely peaceful, that there would be leeway for uh, very far-reaching change. And similarly, that as long as Czechoslovakia didn't give any hint that there would be um, uh, withdrawal from the Warsaw Pact, that that too would give uh, enormous leeway. In, in the case of the, I'll come back to the first of those assumptions. In the case of the Warsaw Pact, it was the wrong lesson to draw because as Charles has, uh, had shown even before the archives opened, but, but as, has become very clear since archival materials uh, have been available, is that the withdrawal from the Warsaw Pact actually came after, Hungary's withdrawal from the Warsaw Pact came after the Soviet decision to invade in 1956. So it, it, that alone clearly uh, wouldn't have been sufficient. Beyond that though, there was concern in Moscow that in fact, regardless of all the assurances that Dubček and others were providing about their fidelity to the Warsaw Pact, that events were moving in such a direction in Czechoslovakia that withdrawal would be uh, likely, perhaps even inevitable. Gromyko had warned of this as early as uh, in April 1968 during a Politburo discussion that uh, he said, even talking about Romania, which gives an indication of the tensions that had uh, developed between the Soviet Union and Romania in that period, roughly 1965 to 68, and, and they peaked in 1968. And in fact, in the immediate aftermath of the invasion, the week after the invasion, Ceausescu, you can see the turnaround in Soviet policy there that Ceausescu is backing away from any hint that Romania itself will, will uh, seek to move further. But, the, um, but Gromyko warned that uh, Romania would be leaving the Warsaw Pact and that Czechoslovakia would follow and that the Warsaw Pact would collapse. On the, on the other point, on the question of uh, Dubček's lesson that he had drawn about as long as events remained peaceful, this was, um, the Soviet Politburo dealt with this in part by shifting to a new argument. This was put by Petra Shellest at, at a party gathering in April 1968. And let me just read what he said to, to give an indication of why, even though events were peaceful, of why still the analogy with Hungary in 1956 would hold. He says, in Hungary in 1956, the imperialists urged the local reactionaries to embark on an armed attack to seize power. Whereas in Czechoslovakia, they are trying to establish a bourgeois order by, pe quote, peaceful means, unquote. That is, they are trying gradually to change the situation so that the reactionaries can gradually seize one position after another. The anti-Soviet elements in Czechoslovakia do not dare to speak out openly in support of anti-communist and anti-Soviet demands. They understand from the Soviet response in 1956 that this game is over once and for all. The enemies provide cover for themselves with demagogic statements about, quote, friendship with this, unquote, with the Soviet Union, while at the same time sowing doubts about some sort of, quote, inequality, unquote, and about the pursuit of a special independent foreign policy. So the notion was that peaceful change in itself could lead to the same outcome that violent turmoil in Hungary had in 1956. And that basic line, which was established as early as April of 1968, 
continued to the time of, uh, of the invasion in August. Let me, because I um, have only a few minutes left, let me just say a few words about the invasion itself. As I mentioned, preparation, the military preparations had begun for this at a quite early stage. Uh, it was an extremely elaborate military operation. It involved the troops of four countries. Um, there was a fifth that claimed to have taken part in it as well, East Germany, but actually didn't uh, at the last moment because of, of changes that were made um, through the uh, pleas of, of Czechoslovak hardliners who were conspiring with the Soviet Union as well as of uh, the Polish leader Gomulka who warned that the introduction of <laughs> German combat troops onto Czechoslovak soil would be construed, would have very negative connotations. So East Germany didn't, the East German combat troops didn't take part even though East Germany, uh, and, and in fact all public statements claimed that there were five countries that had sent troops. The military operation, though, even with four uh, countries involved, and particularly the large number of Soviet troops involved, was extraordinary, uh, extraordinarily elaborate, and there were precautions taken to make sure that there would be no armed resistance in Czechoslovakia, which there wasn't. And um, similarly, that there would be no Western intervention. There was not much concern about Western intervention, but just to be on the safe side, there were precautions taken about that as well. The, the uh, invasion, if you look at this type of operation, proved remarkably successful in a military sense that there was um, relatively little bloodshed. There were 104 people killed in total during the invasion, most, most of these in the Czech clans, a uh, smaller number in Slovakia. There, there was one, um, uh, there was a Bulgarian soldier who was killed, but that was the only casualty on the Warsaw Pact side. And the, the military results were quite impressive in bringing a rebellious society under control, at least military control. Politically, it didn't work uh, particularly well, at least for the first several weeks. But even if you look at it in a political sense, that no military operation is going to be perfect. There's all, if you, any military operation you can point to, any war you can point to, there are going to be uncertainties, um, unexpected events, flaws, uh, and so forth. If you look at this even politically, that by April of 1969, when Dubček was forced out and the new leadership under Gustav Husak were brought in, and uh, by August of 1969, on the anniversary of the invasion, when Czechoslovak troops themselves cracked down on demonstrations, that politically, too, it proved ultimately to be highly successful. And in fact, Czechoslovakia was a, a highly repressive state for the next 21 years. So in that sense, even though it would be comforting to think that the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia foretold the events of 1989, I think it's quite different. I think it preserved a rigid communist bloc for another 21 years that had the Prague Spring been allowed to continue, Soviet leaders were basically right that the type of system that was taking shape in Czechoslovakia at that point was something that was fundamentally incompatible with Soviet notions of what orthodox communism should be. And it wasn't until those notions changed fundamentally as they did under Gorbachev that there was the opportunity for radical change. Okay, Mark, thank you. Thank you. And let's move on to Dr. Agnes Schneller, please. The silent opposition to the regime, communist regime, has constantly hoped for a synchronized effort to change for the better in at least a few Soviet-dominated nations. In 1968, things did not fare better than usual. In Romania, the nationalist dictatorship of Ceausescu seemed to be solidified. In Poland, 
a nationalist, populist, and anti-Semitic wave has gained momentum in the aftermath of which almost all the leading intellectuals of Poland chose to emigrate. Still, there was a slight parallel between the development in Hungary and Czechoslovakia that looked promising. In Hungary, a so-called new economic mechanism has been introduced from 1 January, which loosened state control in economic matters and opened up to a degree a playground for the market. Lukács, in one of his interviews, greeted this development. He believed, as so many Hungarian intellectuals did, that an economic reform clears the way for a political reform. This hope was reconfirmed very soon by the development of the Prague Spring. The political events in Prague, first and foremost, the increasing freedom of the press and speech, pushed the regime towards a transformation of the system towards socialism with a human face. Under Dubček and Svoboda, freedom began to escalate. Skeptics have soon realized that the Soviet leadership will not tolerate any transformation which might lead, if followed only by one single other country, to the collapse of the whole Soviet domination in Eastern Europe. But there was still hope, and rightly so, for in politics, contingency reigned supreme. It was in the very moment that the news about the Paris Spring arrived. Travel to the West was then not a frequently granted privilege with the exception of Yugoslavians and also the Poles for a degree. Yet those who returned, especially young people, were highly enthusiastic. Some even brought pieces of barricades as a souvenir. Since Yugoslavia did not belong to the Warsaw Pact state, the impact of the Paris May was different there than in other East European countries, and so was its aftermath. In the universities, especially in Belgrade, it came to typically Western kind of student movements. The slogans, the posters, demands were also similar. Those movements were suppressed. Still, the direction to May to six state was different in the Soviet dominated countries than in Yugoslavia. One should not forget that the movement termed the New Left, and especially the student movement, was perhaps the first not centrally organized and monitored global political movement in history. It has spread across all continents and left its mark in very remote places from USA to Japan, from Germany to Australia and Mexico. The global was, however, connected everywhere to the local political agenda, in France to the rejection of Gaullism, in America to the anti-war and civil rights movements, in Japan to the struggle against traditionalism. One should not forget, in addition, that the new left of 68 was not one movement, but a loose conglomerate of many. Included were students' movement, Senzu Stricto, mobilized against the traditional curriculum, the feminist movement, gay rights movements. There were also projects of self-management, self-organization. There were also extreme far leftist movements clinging on the bosom of Mao Zedong and his little red book, in addition anarchists, hippies and hobos. Sexual liberation was one of the top of the agenda. Drug consumption became a habit. The common denominator of these very heterogeneous projects and actions can be described perhaps with two words, anti-authoritarian and change of the way of life. I do not want to evaluate the balance of the movements of 68. They were just like several other events and movements in history. They brought about gains and also losses. Since gains and losses were heterogeneous, they cannot be compared. It depends on the present position or worldview of anyone whether he or she will tip the balance of evaluation in one or the other direction. Sometimes the same movement has a genus phase. For example, the student movements were wholesome insofar as they stood for student participation. Yet at the same time they proved the, to be inimical to the quality of teaching and learning. If one chooses to take the position of democracy, the, separate, the movements 
uh, the uh, separation of the wholesome from the unwholesome became easier. So if you position the position of democracy, you can easily uh, distinguish between with the wholesome and unwholesome aspects of this movement. Terrorist movements and drug consumption were the most dangerous branches of the movements of 68, whereas women's liberation, the ideas and practices of participation belong to its sunny face. But whatever position one takes today, 68 has changed the world in many counts. The everyday life after 68 differs from the everyday life before 68. The revolution has won, yet as it happens in the case of all revolutions, it has also been in the eye of those who believed in it, who cherished high illusions, betrayed. All revolutions are betrayed. Yet as far as Eastern Europe was concerned, at least the countries where the May of 1968 made a real impact, the balance was without question positive. Here, as in the early summer of the movements of the Prague Spring and the movements in Paris reinforced one another, in the perception of the actors of the Soviet-dominated world, they somehow belonged together. Both were about freedom. Moreover, the May of Paris have disillusioned actors of some Soviet-dominated states to preserve at least the momentum of some spiritual activity even after the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia. They could continue to look for niches of freedom in a world of unfreedom while drawing inspiration from the movements of the West. I take my examples mainly from Hungary because this is a story I know from personal experience. A totalitarian regime does outlaw pluralism. Here the party leadership decides what is allowed, what is obligatory, and what is forbidden. Political alternatives, be they movements or ideas, are always outlawed. The same is true about cultural pluralism, yet here, contrary to the political field, the space of maneuvering can be both narrower and wider. The Hungarian culture chief, George Ossiel, for example, distinguished among three groups of cultural products, the supported, the forbidden, and the tolerated ones. Now, the territory where the fight between freedom and unfreedom has taken place was the so-called tolerated space. The question was, who occupies the field of the tolerated? What will be the content? of the occupation on this field. And finally, how can one widen this field? The party wanted to narrow the field, the opposition to widen the field. In this play, between freedom and unfreedom, the ideas of 68 played a very important role. They did in cinema, in music, in philosophy, and in several aspects of forms of life. I would not insist that the ideas of 68 alone appeared as the occupants of the field of the tolerated. The ideas of 68 were mainly the ideas of the new left. Those who tried to occupy the territory of the tolerated were not all new leftists. They were also populists, conservatives, or liberals. Yet those who cherished the purposes of 68 May were, at least at the beginning, leftists. And the Communist Party had far more problems with them than with others. The Communist Party namely claimed the privilege of being the party of the left. The same privilege was also granted to the so-called brother or sister parties, among them to the Italian, the French, Ger German party, and so on. Since the new left movements regarded the so-called official parties as the parties of establishment, and of Yalta, of course, the new leftist influence in Eastern Europe could not be accepted as leftist by the party. They labeled them either as right deviationists or far leftist deviationists. But at any, any rate, all new leftists were considered <coughs> deviationists and as such dangerous. They were considered even more dangerous for the regime than the straightforward political conservatives or populists, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for they were seen also as a competition. First and foremost, as competition for the soul of the young. And the party bosses could not have had doubts. Who is going to get the upper hand in this conflict? Mm. 
the heterogeneity of the new left in France, Germany, or Italy was mirrored also in Hungary. Most new leftists were engaged in alternative cultural activities, not without indirect political intent, yet not overtly political in nature. Yet there was also a political organization, even clandestine ones, utterly naive, like the Hungarian Maoists. There was no much sympathy left between these two extreme branches of the new left. For the Maoists, all the others were regarded as liberals, inauthentic in their leftist ideas. For the ones active in cultural movements, the Maoists were crazy people who wanted to introduce into Hungary a regime even far worse than ours. But when the state began to move against them, imprisoning and trying the so-called Maoists, there was solidarity displayed despite great differences in their political positions. At the end, after several years, those groups have met each other on a common ground. The new leftists and other characters of the silent civil opposition, that is those who try to create alternative cultures in the less controlled niches of civil life, were mostly aware of it that their activities, although regarded by the party as dangerous, were just like the prick of the needle on the body of the system. Given that jokes are also pricks of the needle, um, I can tell you a, a joke which was circulated about the so-called resistance and the real resistance of the alternative culture. I tell you the joke. Guru is sitting with his wife at the dinner table. Suddenly gangsters break the door, enter the apartment. They draw a circle in the middle of the dining room and tell Grün to stand put with the center of the circle. While Grün obeys, they, the gangsters, move fur, move, remove first the silver, then the paintings, and finally also the furniture from the apartment, and after all it is done, they rape Mrs. Grün too. Then they leave. After they have left, Grün bursts out in a fit of laughter. His wife turns to him with horror. Are you out of your mind? You are robbed from all your belonging. Your wife is raped and you keep laughing? But my dear, answers Grün, still laughing, you don't understand. I stepped twice out from the circle. <laughs> now, that's the opposition. By trying to occupy the submissions within the totalitarian system of freedom, well knew that they are just stepping outside a little bit from the circle. Mm -hmm. Yet, the goal was not to topple the system, but to keep themselves apart. The moral right to one's own conviction, taste and ideas. To avoid misunderstanding, this was no uh, there was no, no wish to refuse appearance on the public space, but most of the actors, they could not. They wanted to appear on the public space, but most of the actors had no opportunity to do so. Music, theater, film, literature, theory were the main challengers. But what has, what has to do, what has 68 to do with all this? In fact, almost everything. The communist culture was conservative. Thus, the alternative to it had to be anti-authoritarian, rebellious, creative, and the newest, or at least culture tendencies, which in Eastern Europe were perceived at that time as the newest, must have been embraced. In quality, they were sometimes far higher than the accepted cultural products, especially the, those of the supported ones. But this was not always the case. Sometimes it was just the experience of otherness that called for enthusiasm. The music of youth culture was up to this point determined by the requirements and the traditions of the communist youth movements, dominated by marches or by traditional folk songs and folk dances. There was nothing wrong with the quality of the latter, yet they were not speaking anymore to the young. Now the bands of orchestras of 68 appeared on the scene, sometimes with very original repertoire between the Beatles and the rock. They were looked with the greater suspicion by the masters of the culture. The text of the songs were never openly political, thus they could not be caught. Yet even songs about lost love were sophisticated enough to make young people understand what the song is really about. Andras Kovac made him a documentary film about the movement. Also, the East German beer one 
phenomenon needs to be mentioned when it comes to speaking about the uh, protest music of 68. Jancho, Miklos Jancho, began his famous career as a film director earlier than 68, and already in a very stormy manner. His films were sometimes screened, some other times censored. Yet, the movement of 68 still influenced him deeply. His first film in color about Hungarian youth movements after 47 is partly authentically historical, yet the gestures, the movements, the choreography is in general wore the stamp of the French youth movement. It was also in the circle of Jancho that Hungarian intellectuals could get acquainted with the French new wave cinema, another product of 68. To set up the experiment, experimental theater in private homes in Budapest became widespread. The audience was recruited from the group of dissenters. Such a performance beca became the talk of the city. This kind of theater was later termed postmodern, and rightly so. What has been termed later postmodern, at least in art, appeared on the scene also in the aftermath of the year of 68 in literature, in the wider acceptance of high modernism by the younger generation also came after 68 due to the official pressure in favor of socialist realism. The year of A68 made a great impact also on social theory and philosophy, at least in a few states under Soviet rule. I have mainly Hungary, East Germany, also Romania in mind. As I mentioned, the significant minds of Poland have already left the country prior to the 21st of August in 68, and those Czech intellectuals who were still able to do it left immediately after the Warsaw Pact military intervention and never returned from exile, or some later. In addition, no similar transformation of the theories and theories characterized Yugoslavian intellectuals for reasons I cannot speak about. There existed even before 68 a kind of leftist and also Marxist theory of critical content. But the late recognition of the impossibility to reform the system made it also imperative to address the problematic of the basic principles on which the system was originally based upon. This meant the awakening interest in the alternative analysis of the Soviet type of societies, the critical rejection of some basic Marxian tenets, and finally in unmasking the fraudulent apology of the regime via sober social research. As an example for the theoretical criticism can stand here the work by Markus Kisch and Benze, Is Critical Economy Possible, a book where the authors argued for the irrelevance of the labor zero value, or the work by Konrad and Selene, Intellectuals on the Road of Class Power, a work smuggled out and became famous in the West. As an example for the unmasking of fraudulent apology, could stand here the literary work by Miklos Harasti, Peace Wage, a work where the author presented the realistic picture of the fate of factory workers under the so-called dictatorship of the proletariat. And these books, too, reflect a sixth eight, even if some of the authors, like Markus, had not displayed much sympathy for it. In the last chapter of the collective work, the authors put the greatest emphasis on the positive role of social movements. And as far as Harosti was concerned, he was very much taken by the idea of collective management and workers' councils. The relationship to the new left was even more explicit in East Germany, where Rudi Duschke's influence could not be underestimated, for example, to the famous book of Ru uh, Rudolf Varro. I don't wa want to, sc go, uh, uh, to speak about whether that book were good or bad, but the, I speak about the influence. At this point, it could be considered that the idea of self-management, of workers' ownership, the means of production, and the like, belonged also to the tradition of the Hungarian Revolution of 1956. The memories of the revolution has been buried far more than a decade under severe oppression. Yet May 16 helped them to resurface and play again a role in alternative imagination. Somehow 68 made 56 returning to imagination. Again, 
other aspects of tendencies of a 19th state, together with music, theater, cinema, influence the young generation. First and foremost, the promise of alternative ways of life. Housing communes were established, common living in the peaceful countryside preferred. Some philosophers, among them myself, offered also theories for alternative ways of life for the revolution of everyday life. But whether practicing critical theoretical writing, played music or theater, or practice new forms of life, these groups remain all somehow connected and all belonged to Ecclesia Pressa. Yet they survived and they became a little later even reinforced by the emergence of some is that. There was a continuity here. But the strongest reinforcement together with the forceful support and the revival of some ideas of 1968 came from Poland, from the strike in Dansk and the organization of the Solidarity Movement. The new left was at this time generally regarded as the sink of the past, in the West as much in the East. Yet, the Solidarity Movement brought back the issue together with the memory. Here was a movement, uh, he was a movement organized against the oppressive state. But its aim was not to conquer state power, but to create a broad space of freedom within it, a sphere for civil activity. The movement was not organized by a party. It did not even want to become a party. It remained spontaneous, just like in France in 1968. Workers and intellectuals supported each other. Here comes Michnik in, in the same movement just like in Paris, and several theories, among them Americans, like my colleague Andrew Arato, understood the Solidarity Movement just as the revolt of civil society, as the constitution of a civil society in a place where it has never existed. I would add to it that the growing interest in theories of civil society developed exactly after 68, most in Europe, for example in England. The Solidarity Movement seemed to confirm all their hopes vested in such movement. Solidarity achieved also something new, the establishment of contacts among oppositional groups on the border of legality and illegality. The desire for contact building, the mutual help and solidarity, the informality and spontaneity, the absence of a center, all these have borne the legacy of 1968. No flying universities without the legacy of 68. And here ends the story about the specificity of the influence of the movements of 68 on countries under Soviet rule. And what comes after is rather a shared history. Many things have changed under the impact of May 68 and its aftermath. We all know that young people can now live in the same apartment without marriage certificate or shame, that we can dress informally even in the theater, that there is student participation in most universities, that all professions are open for women, business and politics included, that gay couples cannot be abused publicly, that democracy became transformed into mass democracy everywhere with a kind of populist inkling, that there is no institutional authority, at least not in democratic countries, that sex is day and night spoken about, that men and women know everything about their body, but perhaps nothing about their soul. It, I could continue the list, but to sum up, everyday life has been radically changed. I want at the end to uh, point at a very interesting development, which has received in my mind less attention. We refer to the movement on 96 as to the new left, both in the East and the West and also to something new in general. It is interesting that in one respect, this new phenomenon turned out to be also the end of something. It ended, namely, the hegemony of radical thinking among European intellectuals. From the early 20th century onwards, European intellectuals, writers and painters included, were enamored with radical thinking and movements. The majority of the cream of the famous thinkers, poets, and artists turned to the extremes like communism and anarchism on the one side, fascism and Nazism on the other. Liberalism was normally despised as being a pedestrian and apologetic position unfitted for creative minds. 
However, slowly but surely, 68 changed all. From the following decade onwards, most intellectuals of the former New Left, together with their sympathizers, became liberals, both in the West and in the East. Their attitudes and basic ideas became synchronized in an entirely different way than expected. Liberalism became the dominating position occupied by most of the significant intellectuals, in practice even by those who are still sticking to far leftist positions until the present day. There is indeed something that Hegel pointed out, which he termed the rules of reason. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Turn to Nick Miller. Hi. I will not check the requisite autobiographical boxes, except to say that I'm Brad's age, more or less. Um, I've also retitled my paper. I was, I was given sort of a, a title to hang with for a while, but now I'm calling the paper Yugoslavia's 1968, The Great Surrender. Uh, for Yugoslavia, 1968 did not follow a European script, and its drama lacked clear political and intellectual contours. Between Belgrade's student movement, tumult in the Serbian League of Communists, the growing national movement in Croatia, and a rebellion in Kosovo, the year was one of entirely mixed messages. Of all of these events, only the Belgrade student movement fits comfortably into any recognizable global pattern regarding the year itself. The others, to me, were just signs of a crisis in a state that had yet to determine how to govern itself. Yugoslavia's 1968 came as one version of a socialist Yugoslavia was expiring, and other emerging. Processes overlapped as the potentially self-managing reform Marxist Yugoslavia became just another example of actually existing socialism. Um, I'll begin by providing three snapshots from the year. The first comes from June. <clears throat> the Belgrade University student movement, which lasted from June 2nd to June 9th, was tame compared to similar movements elsewhere. Uh, the student movement, which spread to other universities in Yugoslavia, in a much more weak fashion, was fueled by real resentments. Slogans from the demonstrations spoke of the red bourgeoisie, the enrichment uh, of enrichment at the expense of workers, and in general, the failures of self-management. They were overwhelmingly economic in nature. Students occupied buildings at Belgrade University for several days. They formed action committees. They attracted the attention and support of leading members of the critical intelligentsia, both communist and non-communist. Before the movement gained much traction beyond students, though, Tito himself appealed to them in a famous and disingenuous speech on June 9th, in which he conceded that the students had legitimate complaints about their educational system uh, and the economy, but that they had been poisoned by Gilasites, Rankovicites, and Mao Tse Tungites who manipulated them. Those are quotes. Student leaders interpreted Tito to mean that the state would address their grievances. Second snapshot comes from the 14th plenum of the Central Committee of the League of Communists of Serbia. The 14th plenum did not have nearly the impact at the time that it would have come to have in Serbian and Yugoslav historical memory. Um, the outlines of the event are clear. Uh, Dobrica Čosic and Jovan Marjanovic were two members of the Central Committee that met at the end of May 1968, and thus slightly before the student movement began. They each criticized the direction of the policies of the League of Communists of Serbia and of Yugoslavia towards the autonomous provinces of Serbia, Kosovo and Vojvodina. Čosic's speech received more attention. He decried the growth of bureaucratic nationalisms. He noted that nationalist etatism can bring into serious doubt our ambition to create a society of socialistic self-management, unquote. While Čosic has been accused of spewing nationalist hate speech at the 14th plenum, the lesson we should take from this speech is not that he was a closet nationalist or that he somehow opened the floodgates of Serbian nationalism. Instead, we should just duly note that his speech was a criticism of the failures of self-management as of May 1968, as he saw them. Those failures were apparent to him in the growth of republican and provincial bureaucracies, which he believed self-management promised to shrink, not enhance. He sought, he said, the creation of a society in which national equality is created via social relations, but without the state framework, state attributes, national ideology, and national or bureaucratic defenders or representatives. A third snapshot. 
In November 1968, violent demonstrations of Albanian students broke out in Pristina and several other Kosovo towns. They were brought under control by force. Estimates of participation range from the hundreds to the thousands. All agree that there was scattered Albanian and Serbian violence in the area through the following year, at least. Early official versions blamed social unrest, quote unquote, similar to that which brought Belgrade University students into the streets in June. The party, though, later credited Albanian chauvinism supported by propaganda from Albania itself and encouraged by Serbian and Montenegrin nationalism with spurring the protests. One could also include as a complement to the Albanian situation a growing Croatian national movement, which really wouldn't find its voice for a couple more years but was building momentum in 1968. These events do cohere even if they don't seem in any way similar. I would argue that they were all products of a great surrender on the part of Yugoslav communists, a surrender that saw the party shrink before the reality of economic crisis and concede all creative ground to the need to address that crisis, which it did, constitutionally or administratively. And the catalyst then to these apparently disparate events, which put Marxist students, Albanian separatists, and communist bureaucrats in motion nearly simultaneously, was administrative reform. In Yugoslavia, administrative change put that which made, the U made Yugoslav socialism unique, including self-management and a solution to national enmities in the state, in grave danger. Reforms in the 1960s thus saw, foresaw the devolution of economic and political decision-making to the Republican and provincial levels, where these powers would be held by Republican and provincial leagues of communists. Authority was not so much decentralized as it was republicanized. Mm -hmm. yeah. To the extent that Yugoslavia was still viewed as a vital experiment in Marxist thought and practice, these reforms, which put practicality ahead of creativity, management before inspiration, affected the experiment, to say the least. What did this reorganization of authority and administration in Yugoslavia mean for self-management, the original revision to the Stalinist utopia? Since self-management had remained an elusive promise, it depended on one's perspective. For those who benefited from the new situation, Albanians and Croats, for instance, defining themselves, by the way, as such. The republicanist model followed the logic of self-management and that it moved power and decision-making closer to the people. For those who did not benefit from the new situation, Serbs, for instance, as they saw it, the new model betrayed the principles of self-management as they understood them. For them, constitutional reforms in Yugoslavia turned self-management into nothing more than phrases. Serbs, obvious losers in the process of change, looked at events in Yugoslavia and saw their political power threatened, and in extreme cases, they believed their communities to be endangered. The self-management that many of them imagined and one suspects longed for was one in which Republican and provincial borders disappeared, in which local enterprise-level decision-making became the norm, thereby rendering Yugoslavia a nation of people whose identities were entirely local, entirely rooted in what they did. The reforms of the 1960s thus proceeded as if those dreams had never existed. Uh, so this surrender then to practicality was, a dis was as disappointing to many Yugoslavs as it was empowering for others. The economic crisis and ensuing administrative reforms in Yugoslavia prompted a variety of responses, some of them positive and potentially euphoric, others ranging from melancholy to angry. All of them were manifested during 1968. The students and professors of Belgrade University were angry but idealistic. They had discovered they were no longer participating in a grand act of creation, the building of anything new, inherently new. Instead, they were there to be managed by a state that had rapidly lost its dynamism. Dobrica Cosic and other quieter dissenters within the Serbian League of Communists were melancholy, dramatically so. They realized that they were participating in the death throes of their ideal version of a self-managing Yugoslavia sacrificed to economic and administrative realities. On the positive side of the ledger were Albanian and Croatian nationalists for whom republicanization and administration seemed like a concession to their national interests. Over time, though, they would discover that the new reality in Yugoslavia was only superficially theirs. So, Yugoslavia's 1968 generated both disappointment and euphoria momentarily. Each of the three disparate strands of opposition that I've discussed so far, students, Chosic, nationalists, eventually developed into its own movement that shared much, at least in form, with movements elsewhere in Eastern Europe that emerged from the failure of the Prague Spring and other events. 
It's possible to say, in other words, that Yugoslav opponents of Titoism thereafter chose to, quote unquote, live in truth. And comparing Titoism in its latter phase with other examples of actually existing socialism is easy enough. But the truths that Yugoslav opponents of the regime told were of an entirely different quality than those told by, for instance, Charter 77. Of the three strands, one of them directly mirrored that followed by the inspiring North, that which followed from the student movement. Following Tito's manipulative speech of June 9th, the government shut down the magazine student and drove the student leaders and their professors from the university. The regime revealed through its actions just how disingenuous its response to the student movement had been. The Belgrade Eight, all, all members of the Praxis Group and professors at Belgrade University were forced from their jobs by 1975 and hounded for the next decade and longer by the government. Younger professors and students who followed their lead were also expelled from the university or forced to quit their jobs there. For many of them, what had been a vital Marxist opposition gradually turned into a more general search for standard classical liberal goals, the right to speak, the right to gather, the right to open critique of their political, social, economic, and cultural system. For them, the system that emerged in Yugoslavia after 1968, and more specifically after the 1974 constitution was announced, was just as base as any other in Eastern Europe following the death of the Prague Spring. Um, the second variety of opposition in Yugoslavia that I've named is strictly Serbian. It was initiated by Ćosić with his May 1968 14th plenum speech, and, and, he was, and it remained his possession, singularly, until Tito died and then a bit longer. Chosich, in other words, was a very lonely voice for his position for, most, uh, for, 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 for quite a while, which was that Serbs suffered disproportionately and purposely in Tito's Yugoslavia, which had used them to support its centralism until the 1960s, and then discarded and eventually even cannibalized them after the promulgation of the 74 Constitution, his view. Chosich's approach to dissent was idiosyncratic and narcissistic. He generalized from his own experience as a one-time true-believing Titoist who moved into opposition once it became clear to him, to him that Titoism and Serb Serbophobia were one and the same. Whether reflected in Ćosić's work to revive Serbian cultural organization, or in his literature from the 70s and 80s, or in his more consciously movement-building work after Tito died via the Committee for the Defense of the Freedom of Thought and Expression, Ćosić was a single voice for a Serbian renaissance until about 1986, when other, jo other Serbs joined his one-man chorus. He also, it should be noted, remained a convinced socialist who hoped until the end to reinvigorate the experiment that Tito had abandoned in the 1960s. Finally, the third category of opposition, which was nationalist, overtly so. Unlike the aforementioned two, uh, the nationalists that I'm talking about emerged from the 60s affirmed. Theirs was an ascendant trajectory after 1968. There were, for instance, euphoric nationalists like those who had led the Croatian Spring and others who kept a simmering Albanian nationalism alive through the 70s and 80s. The same surrender that so disappointed Ćosić and the students and their professors had emboldened the Albanian and Croatian nationalists in the late 1960s and early 1970s. These were men and women whose movement superficially resembled that of Ćosić, but where Ćosić's nationalism was suffused in melancholy, theirs was positive and affirmative. Unlike Ćosić, they were unencumbered by much residual faith in the Yugoslav socialist experiment. As did Ćosić, they competed within their own national community for support with those, whose mem with those members of the first type of opposition mentioned above, those who chose to oppose on the basis of values and ideals rather than coll collectivist notions of the nation. These then were three nodes of modes of opposition that emerged in Yugoslavia after 1968. An oddity of the state of opposition in Yugoslavia is that while these people were divided by ideology, they were remarkably interrelated, personally and otherwise. otherwise. The Praxis group included intellectuals from Croatia, Serbia, and elsewhere. They all worked together, and Ćosić was often considered part of the same community. In hindsight, this seems strange, perhaps, but at the time I believe that those who collaborated all saw themselves as part of the same project, which was still to help Yugoslavia fulfill its promise, which was a quite old promise by now. There was a relatively brief historical moment between 1980 and 1985 when it appeared that many of these disparate forms of opposition could unite into something just as universalist as Char Charter 77 or CORE. After Tito died in 1980, a group of Serbs, including Ćosić, tried to create a journal of ideas that would be called The Public in English, 
This would be a Yugoslav journal that would take up the cause of the old struggle of ideas initiated in the 1950s following the break with Stalin in the hope that with Tito's death, the free flow of ideas might lead to a more vital socialism in Yugoslavia. We are told that over 400 people from across Yugoslavia signed a letter of support for the journal. The government rejection followed by the government's arrest and conviction of a Serbian poet for having written about Tito in ugly ways prompted the birth of an underground movement for free speech. Two committees emerged, the Committee for the Protection of Artistic Freedom in 1982, Committee for the Defense of the Freedom of Thought and Expression in 1984. They were both assiduous defenders of the right to free speech, and they considered themselves representatives of all Yugoslavs. They defended that right in petitions, probably hundreds of them, if not more, that the Yugoslav public rarely or ne never or perhaps rarely saw. They defended Albanians who were in prison. They defended Bosnian Muslims who were in prison. They defended Croats and Slovenes and Serbs. And they did so with a remarkable degree of um, open-mindedness, I suppose, in hindsight. The potential for this, of this free speech movement was killed, though, by the unwillingness of various intellectual communities defined nationally to work together. The communities which might have become much greater than their origins as defenders of speech remained Serbian productions. When the second and more influential one was formed in November of 1984, Slovene and Croat invitees turned down the invitation, noting that they would rather work in their own local communities. And I don't say this in order to blame anybody. It's just this is the way things played out in the mid-1980s. Still, though, it was possible that Serbian intellectuals and cultural leaders could tap the strength of this commitment to free speech to build something greater, even if only Serbian. Alas, the mo the, that moment neatly coincided with the critical transition in the nature of the free speech movement. In May 1985, Kosovo emerged into the Serbian consciousness with an act of violence that enraged the Serbian intellectual elite, uh, which now gravitated to the more self-absorbed Chosic, uh, Chosic vision of a Serbian rather than Yugoslav or socialist future. From that point, the principled free speech movement trans transitioned into a much less principled movement in defense of the Serbian nation. The potential for an a-national approach to opposition in Yugoslavia went untapped, therefore. It would be useful to evaluate the various strands of Yugoslav opposition against the standards established elsewhere in Eastern Europe. Generally, what we end up with is a panorama of Yugoslav opposition that occasionally looks and feels like other inspiring forms, but with a bit of slippage. Things are not quite what they seem or what they could have been or what was claimed for them. While a key to the work of the most inspiring opponents of actually existing regimes in the northern tier, Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Hungary, was their conclusion that the regimes were not reformable and thus that the only option was to separate spiritually from an inauthentic existence. In Yugoslavia, if this happened, it happened in strange ways. One reason for this is that many Serbian and Slovene opponents of the regime continue to believe in socialism, continue to argue from socialist and even original, call them Titoist, precepts, and in fact embrace the concept behind one of the key catchphrases from the early and more vital days of Titoism, which was that intellectuals should be participants in a great struggle of ideas. Croats, on the other hand, never really looked back on Titoism nostalgically, instead rejecting the state rather categorically after the end of the Croatian Spring. Their rejection of the order in which they lived might, therefore, have rendered them analogs to Kor, Havel, the various standard bearers of the parallel society, Ultimately, though, we don't think of any of the men and women associated with the 68th generation among Serbs, Croats, Slovenes, or Albanians as part of the same phenomenon. The reason for this is probably that while the form of their action might have been similar, the content of their ideas was quite different. Havel, Miknik, Conrad, Living in Truth, Antipolitics, the Parallel Polis Corps, Charter 77, these are all linked not just because they represented a rejection of the notion that communism in its actually existing form could be reformed, but because their ideas and actions that emerged from those ideas were, this is a scientific term, beautiful. Much of the beauty in their ideas and their actions derived from the fact that they all reflected the belief that one could live an authentic life while surrounded by artifice and coercion. So far, so good. We can actually identify this sort of thing happening in Yugoslavia. Belgrade, we are told, had a flying university in the late 1970s and the early 1980s. Dobert Cicosic talked incessantly about the need for truth before and after his break with the party. Many Croats and Albanians went to prison for their ideas, just as Havel, Miknik, and others did for theirs. Following Tito's death in 1980, a good portion of Serbia's intellectual elite participated in a protest movement 
that involved those constant petitions, underground oversight committees, and occasional persecution. In Kosovo, the 1990s were marked by the most elaborate example of a parallel polis in Yugoslavia, I believe. We can, in other words, check a few requisite living in truth boxes in Yugoslavia, but I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical because the ideas that populated these examples of truth and authenticity were not, in fact, beautiful. Instead, these ideas were the ideas of ethnic exclusivism rather than universalist humanism. When Croatian opponents of the regime went to prison, they went as national separatists. Um, when Serbs expressed their ideas in this time period, they did the same. Uh, the Croats did not go to prison as creators, but as destroyers. They may have had cause, their cause may have been just, but it was not inspirational, it was not beautiful, it was antagonistic and narrow, as was the Serbian. When Dobrit Sačosic, in his lonely phase between 1968 and 88, spoke of the need for truth, the truths he spoke were usually narcissistic truths about the Serbian nation. The Kosovo example was inspirational, but it happened in a time of war. Uh, this was not an example of living in truth so much as an example of keeping one's head down to avoid it being shot off. So to conclude, ultimately, as in other East European communist countries, the lessons of 68 in Yugoslavia were probably that the most powerful intellectual and cultural forces in society determined that they had to, quote, abandon the rusty Leninist paradigm and to, quote, unquote, transfer power from the party elite to society. What makes Yugoslavia unique is what happened when power finally made that transition. The fact that processes that could begin in such similar conditions and follow such analogous paths, marked by the same words and shared goals, the search for honest, authentic communication, the truth, and wind up at such radically different conclusions demands an explanation. <clears throat> I would argue that the solution to this dilemma can be found in the types of issues that the regimes in question lied about. In Yugoslavia, when the regime had made promises, one of the primary promises was that it would bring an end to ethnic conflict among the people of the state. When it failed to measure up to its own promises, it told its population lies, just as the Hussaks and Giriks of the world had done, but with different content. When Czechs, Slovaks, Poles, or Hungarians became outraged, they became outraged at assaults on their human dignity. When Yugoslavs became outraged, they became outraged at betrayals of their national dignity. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Christian Vasile, up next. Thank you. My paper examines the relationship between uh, Romanian intellectuals and Ceausescu's regime with a particular emphasis on the late 1960s. It surveys uh, some of the reasons for the absence of a solid reform movement oriented towards uh, dissident Marxism and capable of defying uh, the neo-Stalinist tendencies of the Romanian Communist Party, RCP, Power, ho power holders. Uh, it will also examine, it will also analy analyze the uh, 1968 uh, political and ideological actions of some uh, important figures of the Romanian intelligentsia. Uh, unlike Czech and Slovak philosophers, uh, their Romanian peers uh, did not draw up and did not uh, pursue the path of uh, an anti-Stalinist critique with uh, elements of alternative political conceptualization. The belated appearance of an anti-Soviet strand in the nation-building process under communism, the radical anti-intellectual repression wave at the end of uh, the 1950s and beginning of 1960s, and the, inter the internal disputes within crea creative unions, uh, universities and uh, academy, all, all these were, uh, were crucial factors uh, that favored Ceausescu's con concentration of, of power and instrumentalization of national feelings. With uh, few exceptions, Romanian philosophers were tainted by opportunism and timidity and uh, neglected the cooperation and dialogue with, with the Writers Guild, uh, and by and large, the later hoped, uh, especially between 1965 and uh, 1971, to get the best out of, of uh, their strange bad fellowship with Nicolae Ceausescu, the supreme leader of RCP. Subsequently, Many of them joined the RCP and supported uh, 
the communist leadership in the context of the Soviet invasion in Czechoslovakia, when the intellectuals' confidence in Ceausescu was shattered mainly by uh, his neo-Stalinist uh, drive from 1971, it was already too late uh, and for any reform or revisionist uh, attempt. In the autumn of uh, 2006, Professor Vladimir Tismanianu reopened the file concerning the 1965 unmasking of uh, some philosophy department uh, rebelling students. Uh, usually, the July 1965 uh, 9th Congress of the Romanian Communist Party uh, was celebrated by Nicolae Ceausescu and uh, his ideological servants as an anti-dogmatic moment, which indicated uh, a sort of communist renewal, ideological relaxation and liberalization. But a few months later, a violent episode in the history of the Bucharest University's philosophy department thwarted uh, this myth of the post-1965 Ceausescu's propaganda. <coughs> It is true that uh, there were some discouraging uh, signs in the spring of 1965. Even during the period of cultural re relaxation, any form of student initiative which avoided youth party organization was repudiated by the, the Agit Prop, Department of Propaganda and Agitation, and such things happened in the case of a memorandum signed by uh, 300, uh, 300 students demanding more opportunities for intellectual and artistic advance and promotion in the field of scientific and uh, literary creation. Moreover, in the fall of uh, 1965, a group of uh, five students became victim of a shameful frame-up staged by the Securitate in co cooperation with the party apparatus and the communist youth organization. This sort of uh, show trial was organized at uh, the main lecture hall of the university and some of the contemporaries compared it with the 1950s unmasking of class enemies. Uh, set up by chief ideologist Leon Terautu and uh, his team of the, the Agit Prop. Those students who were the leaders of their generation used to intensely discuss theoretical issues and frequently asked inconvenient questions during teaching seminaries. Moreover, they expressed reticence toward Ceausescu's policy and pleaded for the abandoning of Stalinist theories and practices. The ide ideological prosecutors, <coughs> both from the Agit Prop and Ministry of the Interior, accused them of, quote, launching revisionist theories which have nothing in common with Marxist-Leninist doctrine, unquote, such as the passage from socialism into communism in a violent way through a resort to the masses. The alleged leader of the group, Stefan Nikolic, has been charged with the attempt to illegally rally his university colleagues. According to the official version, the aim of this reunion was to urge the people to go out and demand the real turn to communism by replacing the state property with all people's property. Stefan Nikolic got support for this act and went too, too far. He blamed the RCP leadership for diminishing the rev revolutionary vigilance and for adopting a bourgeois way of life in, in bourgeoisation. Consequently, Nikolic and his fellows, according to the ideological indictment, regarded the students as the only true revolutionary force that had the task to take action in order to ensure ensure the, the transition to communism. The professors did not take action to dismiss the accused or to exonerate them from the blame. In fact, some of, uh, of the philosophy professor, professors 
Tudor Bugnaio among them, were put on, on, on the blacklist too by, by the agit prop and uh, political police. Those professors, some of them former Stalinist cadre, presented a sort of critical perspective on official Ceausescu's Marxism-Leninism, and uh, after 1964 uh, embraced uh, humanistic Marxism, uh, the 1965 power holders solved this incipient ideological conflict both by intimidation and divide and conquer policy, namely by encouraging their rivals, young professors eager to, to become uh, social upstarts and who identified themselves with the Romanian nationalistic beliefs of, uh, of the Ceausescu regime. Accidentally or not, some of the heretical professors were of, uh, were of Jewish origins, and it remains to, to be seen whether the, their decline is due to, to the first, first uh, xenophobic tendencies of Nicolae Ceausescu as leader of, of RCP. After the party leadership decided to brutally intervene, uh, Professor Tudor Bugnariu lost his uh, position as dean at the philosophy department, and some of other Marxist enthusiasts, uh, such as some professors of aesthetics, did not influence much uh, the ideological debate within the party insofar as to create uh, a breakthrough. Uh, their initiatives were limited to, to bringing to light uh, in the 1970s and uh, the 1980s of uh, both passages lifted from Karl Marx's writings and uh, a few, of a uh, few valuable philosophical and so sociological writings. Uh, Professor Michael Shafir pertinently described both the, the 1960 60, Eight debate over whether philosophy is a science and uh, the few attempts to, to liberate philosophy from strict party supervision. He concluded that the lack of uh, Marxist tradition is res responsible for, for uh, the inability of uh, intellectuals to formulate demands for change in required Marxist terminology. Uh, Mihai Shora, one of the most important contemporary Romanian philosophers, uh, philosopher of dialogue, as Aurelian Krajutu, who I believe uh, is with us, called him, uh, and uh, a former communist without being a Marxist, expressed uh, a few, uh, similar point of view. After 1989, Mihai Shora explained why in Romania former Marxists and pro-Stalinist intellectuals did not constitute the driving force for Marxist revisionism and democratic socialism, which led to the 1955, uh, 50, 56 Hungarian Revolution and to 1968 Prague Spring. In his opinion, the Hungarians, the Czechs, and even the Poles had an important and lasting left-wing movement with a solid intellectual support and participation the dur duration and the constancy uh, from the interwar period created a political and intellectual tradition. That was also the reason why the public perception in the 1950s and 1960s did not mistake, did not confound the entire Marxist political structure and the movement with the foreign Soviet occupation. Uh, besides this cultural ideological aspect, one could also evoke the lack of solidarity and the low ability to, to defy uh, the Department of Propaganda and Culture in the case of Romania. For example, as Vladimir Kuzin wrote, a team uh, led uh, by philosopher Radovan Richta did function in Czechoslovakia and commented on the scientific and technical revolution. It emphasized that the reality of the modern world cannot be controlled with po power political means, but only through science and uh, the idea that Ajit Prop <coughs> was not omnipotent. No such real interdisciplinary dis dis team existed in Romania. The fact that uh, the evil spirit of Leon Terautu 
the most important ideologist of uh, the RCP, Romanian Workers' Party, survived even after 1965, uh, also meant the suppression or at least the discouragement of any theoretical debate and that could steadily bring, bring up seriously the issue of Ceausescu's official Marxism. The tight ideological control over theoretical debates and literary circles dejected many, many intellectuals. Moreover, the fact that some of them emigrated during the 1970s probably weakened the feeble group of those cap capable of theoretical innovation. Those who remained did not influence the cultural ideological battle for political cha change and did not contribute to reforming Ceausescu's socialism. The lack of dialogue within the Romanian intellectual milieus, especially between philosophers and writers, uh, deeply influenced the cultural developments in the 1970s and 1980s. At the end of 1960s, philosopher Constantin Noica has published numerous articles in Gazeta Literară, Romania Literară, the main writers' union uh, weekly magazine, but uh, he as former uh, sympathizer of the interwar extreme right legionary movement, uh, he could not and did not want to, to bring an ideological contribution to, to, to the theoretical discussion on, on Marxism. Uh, on the other hand, one of uh, post-war Romania's leading writers, Nicolae Breban, a German-speaking Romanian interested in, in philosophy and former student at, at the philosophy department, placed his trust on Ceausescu until 1971. Moreover, his favorite write, re readings were Schopenhauer and Nietzsche, not Marx. Breban joined the Central Committee of RCP and became a favorite by, uh, by the regime novelist. He understood too late that uh, Nicolae Ceaușescu did not have the intention to, to abandon the idea of, the idea of tight con ideological control over, over literature. One of the most important bad omens for, for the cultural liberalization appeared even in 1968 after Ceausescu's condemnation of Soviet invasion in Czechoslovakia. In his speech delivered on December 20, 28, 1968, in front of creative unions and cultural institutions representatives, Nicolae Ceausescu was, to all appearances, inclined to gain the goodwill of the writers and uh, artists, but uh, this seemingly uh, concil conciliatory gesture were ac accompanied with innuendos and vague warnings. Ceausescu let the intellectuals know that he did not intend to focus on the ideological errors and on the lack of uh, political orientation of their works, but he did take into consideration uh, the obedience to, to the ruler uh, himself. Ceausescu also mentioned, among uh, other things, some, quote, drawbacks and deficiencies in Romanian art and culture, as exemplifying with the fact that theater direct directors are receptive towards Western influences or foreign stage representations, and consequently they went as far as to compel the attention of the RCP leadership. The hardening of the tone towards the intellectual com community culminated in July 1971, when Ceausescu's cultural ideological thesis announced an era of censorship and stagnation. Uh, in conclusion, unlike the Czechoslovak case, where the fusion of reformists sought inside and outside the political structure produced a feeling of national unity as an aggregative force inclined towards, towards a new model of socialism, of democratic socialism, and uh, where the post-January 1968 power holders proved a moral sincerity, a sort of moral sincerity, in Romania, Ceausescu was in fact the embodiment of the conservative communist regime, 
uh, a latent uh, neo-Stalinist, a sly Antonin Novotny, not an Alexander Dubček. Ceaușescu confiscated the formulation of a new model of democratic socialism. Probably uh, the, latter, the latter was an alien concept for the majority of the intelligentsia. The lack of trust, lack of self-confidence, the communication deficit within the Romanian intellectual milieus, especially between philosophers and writers, and the 1950s large-scale repression, unmaskings, various forms of, of harassment, which continued af even after 1965, could explain the failure of, of reform uh, in Romania uh, after 1989, some analysts and uh, eyewitnesses suggested that uh, the resistance through culture was a convenient excuse for moral uh, resignation and even cynicism. Uh, the political culture of Romanian socialism was different in comparison with the Czechoslovak one. The Romanian so social democracy was weak and crashed after 19. Uh, uh, 48. Unlike Romania, Czechoslovakia was uh, an urban society which possessed a fair level of industrial sophistication. A part of the Romanian intellectuals was from rural, o rural origins, and so Ceausescu was the, the, the leader of uh, national revival. This group tended to, to view Marxist ideology as a foreign entity for the Romanian soul, and placed their trust and even gambled on Ceausescu's na nationalistic and anti-Soviet discourse. Uh, the skillful ma manipula manipulation of the national ideology provided a strong and enduring focus on, of identification with the communist regime, <laughs> and especially with uh, Ceausescu, who just condemned condemned the, the, the Soviet intervention in, uh, in Czechoslovakia. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, as, uh, not just as discussed, but old Wilson said her hand, I'm, I'm shocked, I'm frankly shocked, as Claude Rains uh, said in Casablanca, to find that we're running a little over, uh, and uh, <laughs> at the same time, uh, I've also been given some permission that uh, uh, in order to have a little time for questions, we can even sneak past the 12.30 uh, time, but absolutely under no circumstances past uh, a quarter to one, and we'll see if we fall short of that, if we, we, we fall in various uh, in other ways. But let me go ahead with uh, remarks entitled 1968 as the vanishing point for communist Eastern Europe. Now, my own experience of 68 and my subsequent position at the Wilson Center on the 20th anniversary in 1988, they provide one set of comments for me on these instructive uh, papers. I'll try to uh, hold the memories to a, a bare minimum, but instead concentrate on connecting uh, my comments with the recent work of a Vanderbilt historian, uh, Helmut Walter, Walzer Smith, on the continuities of German history just out from Cambridge. His introductory chapter is devoted to the notion of a vanishing point. Not a positive turning point, but a negative turn from which there could be no recovery except the turn's own total negation. Now, Smith uses the notion to discount two past vanishing points in dealing with the German problem, quote-unquote, that's Hitler's Nazi Germany. First, 1871 and the supposed Sonderweg leading from Bismarck's Germany straight to the Third Reich as favored by post-war Western historians uh, initially and actually even before them uh, as favored by post-war German historians 1933 Hitler's rise to power. Helmut Smith uh, draws on much recent work to call 1941 the vanishing point work uh, by Jan Kershaw, my colleague Jeffrey Herf, others, work that puts the Holocaust at the center of the European tragedy and the Nazi defeat that both followed inexorably from that point. 
Well, I want to suggest that we think of 1968 as the vanishing point for a communist Eastern Europe, Yugoslavia included, not just for the long-term prospects of its communist regimes, but also for the close connection of their societies with each other, Yugoslavia included as Eastern Europe. The ensuing desynchronization of the Soviet bloc after 1968 in Agnes Heller's apt phrase, and the disconnect with Yugoslavia that would, uh, uh, that would follow made uh, Brezhnev's notion of a socialist commonwealth ring hollow indeed. Now how these quote, East European, quote, states uh, uh, followed after 1989, sometimes to break apart themselves, also trying to reconnect with a wider, more promising European framework. That's a work in progress, and that's the 20-year anniversary coming next year. For now, I'll start with uh, Mark Kramer's uh, comments, uh, uh, not only dealing with Czechoslovakia, the center of events, but also it's the longest paper. Um, and one recollection, on the Student Union Terrace at the University of Wisconsin in Madison in 1968, meeting with uh, a man of the European New Left, originally from Romania, but, but now in the West, the late Georges Opt, I think a name that may ring some bells, died much, much too early. But he spoke to me on that sunny day of his hope for a new socialist humanism coming from Czechoslovakia and transferring elsewhere. August 19th, 1968, the day before the Soviet forces came in, and others too. Now let me turn from Madison memories to Wilson Center Times, first meeting with Yuzhi Peche and others, understanding this from the late 1980s standpoint, the legacy of its Prague, Prague Spring, its, its suppression, a tragedy that I came to see it then and see it now as a, as a, as a mixture of the civil society legacy for Czechoslovakia in the interwar years that usually I think was emphasizing yesterday, facing mixing first with a special left commitment on the side of Czechs in particular, new left slash socialism slash communist party, maybe it'll work out after all, slash respect for Russian cultural and intellectual uh, traditions and force, and slash distrust of the post-Munich West. This was a commitment uh, that led, as we used to say, to more true believers in uh, especially the Czech part, than you'd find elsewhere in Eastern Europe. Then the shock of the Soviet invasion to that civil society with its left commitment, all the greater, all the more shock. Arnos Klima, others that I remember, just can't believe this. And a Prague winter, as Mark Kramer says, that it's a long time till 1977 in Charter. Uh, uh, Charter 77 comes forward. Now Mark's paper points uh, uh, to the importance of the Soviet imperatives, detailing this early emergence, uh, or, or rather this belated emergence of Warsaw Pact consolidation. So it's only from 62 forward. So it's a test for the Warsaw Pact with the loss of Albania, the problems uh, in Romania. And, prob and economic problems that I could go on about. But uh, more important here uh, is uh, the way that on the Soviet side, the memory of 56 in Hungary, I would submit also the Yugoslav case that isn't mentioned but deserves to be mentioned as part of Soviet thinking, then triggering this, uh, uh, this intervention itself, this intervention itself that I now want to uh, uh, return to in, in the other cases, but suggesting that the intervention itself is a vanishing point in Czechoslovakia and in Prague in particular for left socialist connection with uh, the existing Communist Party. It just couldn't uh, be conceived of as working out after that time.
In the Hungarian case, in this different Hungarian case, where, as Agnes Heller has pointed out, yes, new economic policies are underway in, in 68, but recall that those had been started already in 66 as the Kadar regime, having a special concern about 1956, the 10 year anniversary, we cannot allow in this 10 year anniversary for some kind of recurrence. So that's the start of uh, uh, the economic relaxation. And it's also the start of this cultural intellectual policy of self-censorship. 68 being significant for Hungary because somehow this is going to survive. Both the economic uh, uh, changes, reforms, and a certain cultural self-censorship uh, that from 68 forward uh, makes uh, the turn in Hungary, first of all, perhaps a, a hiding point, a way to hide from uh, a really existing regime, uh, a hiding that can uh, spread in this curious, everybody knowing everybody way, the, the, the censor Atzel that you mentioned had a conversation with uh, Magyar Balint, one of our fellows, young fellows here in the what early, uh, late 80s, early 90s, uh, telling uh, Balint, you know, you know, I enjoyed reading your father's books so much. They were really very well done. Uh, I wanted to uh, uh, congratulate uh, uh, you on that accomplishment of your father. Of course, I couldn't permit them to be published. But still, uh, there was this uh, uh, knowledge held in common, uh, common that led in, in some ways, in some spheres, to what another fo fellow of ours used to call communism with a wink. But it wasn't a wink for those on the left. Uh, as Dr. Heller has pointed out. And there, uh, from 68 forward, there was no place for them. Uh, and some departing, some like the late uh, Yori Bensa that I would like to uh, commemorate here for uh, a very dedicated opponent inside Hungary of uh, the regime into the, uh, into the 1980s and paid a terrible price for it because he'd written a doctoral dissertation criticizing Marx and Marxism in the late 60s, early 70s. It stayed buried under the floorboards in a peasant farmhouse through the 70s and 80s because uh, it was not accepted as a dissertation and if it had been found, it would have been, uh, it would have been destroyed. Uh, uh, that's, a, uh, that's an example of how uh, if uh, in the cultural sphere, if in some of these aspects of economic reform, in talking this Hungarian language that the Soviets couldn't understand anyway, uh, there, there was a way to hide. But the only way to hide uh, for someone on the left, as with Bensa, was to hide the dissertation uh, in the floorboards of a peasant village. For the Yugoslav case, and the Romanian one, too, we turn uh, back to the uh, uh, effect of the Soviet intervention itself. The shock in the Hungarian case was the Soviet intervention means uh, hide, wink, uh, do what you can so they can't see what we're doing, and then if it's anything really connected with, with socialism or the left, then that's simply not permitted. Now, as Nick has uh, uh, pointed out, uh, Yes, the competitive nationalisms uh, coming forward. Also, the uh, uh, student movements, what they were demanding was the end of the uh, market reforms of 1965, the Ekonomska Reforma, uh, that was uh, turning, I think, in quite a uh, constructive, advanced uh, direction. The curious irony being there, that the two chaps that uh, Tito then brought forward to lead the Serbian party in 1968. Markozic Nikozic and Latinka Perovic wanted to see the reforma through. Uh, 
They didn't share the Belgrade 8 and the Proxis group and the, uh, this is widening income levels and this is not socialism and that this is not associations. No, for, for Nikozic, self-management was too much of a cultural revolution. And as he went on, you, can, you cannot expect unity within the country if the feeling continues that Serbs are the foundation for Yugoslavia. But he's not going to survive, uh, and Latinka Perovic is not going to survive, although she uh, ha has lived on and is speaking since, uh, since 1989. Nikozic, we tried to get him to say something in a 1981 conference, uh, and uh, he wouldn't come forward, but he's dismissed rather easily uh, in 1972, along with the other liberals, in part uh, because of uh, uh, suppressing national tensions, but the ace in the hole that Tito and uh, Cardell have is the Soviet intervention in 1968 shows that we still must be tough and united and we can't risk any sort of change. If the Soviets could do that, they could come here. And so let's keep telling that to the Americans too. In the National Intelligence Council appraisals of Yugoslavia just published last year, you can see that the American side is still accepting the threat of a Soviet invasion of Yugoslavia as a primary concern to which the United States must respond as late as 1971. So in that sort of atmosphere, let's, let's go ahead and hold ourselves together uh, uh, outside of the Soviet bloc in the same way that in Ceausescu's uh, Romania, where uh, Christian's paper keeps pushing back the vanishing point for any constructive change <laughs> of, of reform in the Romanian communist system, uh, Further back from the old place of, wow, Ceausescu visited North Korea and China in 1971-72, so that's certainly, uh, uh, he, he was inspired there, and that's the change. Now, from what Vlad Tismaniano has presented, we already know that by post-68, then when the Writers' Union is pushing and pressing and trying to come forward, they're quickly cut off and end up being confined to areas like science fiction, where you can get away with saying something uh, on into the 1970s. Uh, uh, Kristen takes us back, uh, even from there, uh, just from the very start of the Ceausescu regime, so that the philosophy students in 1965, they are already uh, being uh, squeezed. They're already talking about uh, being punished for talking about replacing state property with all people's property which I, I would suggest has echoes from what's happened in Yugoslavia and it's another element of the Soviet framework in 1968 uh, to make certain there won't be another Yugoslavia uh, as, as well. But whatever might have been coming forward uh, in this uh, initial Ceausescu regime, and, and we doubt that much would have come forward, what plays into his hands mightily is then the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia. That's his in, uh, occasion to uh, set up this national militia that everyone belongs to, women admitted as well, such enthusiastic participation. I remember hearing about that in 1970 and 71 in Romania. Yes, we're, we're all in the militia ready to go in case the Soviets come. Uh, and what a godsend for uh, this nationalist direction that then also justifies the tightest of control because tight control is needed not only for ideological uh, conformity but also for national defense, uh, a, an argument for national defense that of course is also uh, sent on uh, to the American side that uh, had its illusions about the Ceausescu regime that uh, ran on much too late into the 1970s. But speaking of much too late, <laughs> let's, uh, let's now ask uh, if uh, there would be a uh, some well, questions or I'm, two. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but we're running extremely late and, and um, since we can't push the conference back for, we can delay the second panel. 
um, I recommend that, that the question and answer session happen informally during during lunch. Um, we have We're risking some kind of civil response here, you know, maybe some kind of groups <laughs> I, I, raising I, I, up. I apologize, and, uh, but we <laughs> just cannot. <laughs> we cannot delay the start of the of, of the next panel uh, past one thirty, so we have to be back here at one thirty. Oh, and um, in order not to keep the building, I, I recommend uh, to have lunch uh, either the cafeteria here or at the uh, yeah, or uh, there uh, or at the uh, food court at the ground level. Oh, so that's more than two steps outside the circle, then. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah.